My name is Ann Troca and I'm the Community Engagement Manager at Sargento Foods. We are honored and grateful to be one of your sponsors as well this morning at the Workforce Development Symposium and thank you to the Sheboygan County Chamber for hosting this event annually. I have the pleasure to introduce our next keynote speaker today is an award-winning transformational facilitator and business owner. She empowers people to move their dreams to reality through one-to-one -one meetings, focus groups, and training sessions. She describes herself as being a troubleshooter, a project completer, and a people developer. For over 28 years, she's worked with professional educators at all levels and specializes in developing multi-tiered activities related to equity and belonging. What is equity? and why is a sense of a belonging important? I'm pleased to introduce from 4AM Consulting in Milwaukee, Dr. Alicia Mutri. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Scott, I'm going to try my best to stay right here because you know being an educator is very hard to stay right here in the spot. You know that, right? I'm going to try my best, Scott, I promise. Well, good morning. And the first task before I get into the presentation is to get you guys going. This is a pretty quiet group right now, and it's my job to get you going and kind of get you activated. We're going to make a connection to the sense of belonging, to this equity component, to them saying, what's, what's your call to action? Like, why are you here today? And what will you leave here today ready to do? So it's not just going to be like a sit and get, but literally you're going to have the charge to say, when we leave here, there's some things that I actually can do immediately when I leave here. So let's get you going with just an activity, just to kind of get you going. At any given, uh oh, I was about to move already. Oh, this is going to be tough. I know, right? At any given time in your life, you will have an identity that you relate to the most. So what we're going to do this morning, just to kind of get you engaged and going, I want you to think about identity and equity. That's what we're going to be focusing in on. Around This is called the identity wheel. So around the wheel, and you will have that the copy of the wheel in your program booklet, I want you to look at the, the uh, items that are around the wheel. These are different identities, okay? So you've got race, you've got age, you've got gender. And I don't want to put a definition on any of them, but I want you to look at each of them, and I want you to think about, like, what does that mean for you? And I want you at the table to do two things. One, I want you to choose two identities that you you most connect with. You're going to have a dialogue at the table about that. And why? Like, why did you choose those two that you most connect with? And that doesn't mean that you don't connect with the others, but which two do you connect with the most? And then I want you to pick the next two, and I want you to say, these are the two identities that I, collect, that I connect with the least. Meaning, I don't typically connect with it that much, but that's sort of my two least. And then I want you to share at your table why you have your two choices, okay? So you're going to pick the two that you most identify with and why, the two that you least identify with and why. So here's the other norm we're going to do for today. So you're going to be in talking and you're going to be, I'm getting you engaged, right? So I don't want to have to like scream to kind of get you back. So what's, this is how it's going to work. You guys are going to be talking. You're going to be like having some good talk. You're going to be saying so many intelligent things. But then you're going to hear me say workforce. And when you hear me say workforce, I want you to, wherever you are, stop your sentence and say development, okay? So I'm going to say workforce. You're going to say development. That's going to kind of bring you back, okay? So right now, what I just want to, I just want to practice this, okay? So at the table right now, just kind of tell each other your names that real quick, just introduce them. We're going to try this out. Just talk real quick. Just try it out. Try it out. Try it out. Workforce. Oh, look how that worked. See? I knew this was the A crowd. Okay. So what I want you to do now, seriously, I want you to talk about the two that you most identify with, the two that you least identify with, and then why. Have that dialogue at the table. Make sure everybody's voice is at the table, so don't monopolize the time. Let everybody talk, okay? I'm going to give you about 10 minutes to do that. So go for it now, please. Workforce. Yeah, that was okay. Yeah, you guys did okay. I'm listening to the dialogue, and you're going exactly where I was hoping to go. Everybody had different definitions of what some of these identities meant. 
which ones we connect to. You also thought about, some of you thought about, you were able to explain why. You know, somebody talked a little bit about being uh, adopted and not even knowing what their ethnicity is about. So that's not important to me. Or somebody says, some of the identities, when I walk in the room, everybody knows that I'm a female. Or when I walk in the room, everybody knows that I'm African American. So there's some identities that we relate to that I don't even have to talk about or we don't have to talk about. People can see it. But what happens when that identity that's most important to you is neglected or folks don't give value to it? Or what happens if the, the identity that I identify with the most is not one that the people that I'm leading identify with the most? So we are together today. I wanted to do this activity. And I must do a little commercial break here to say, because I am a teacher, I always present things that you can go back and do. Right? So I want you to consider some of the things that I do today. It's not just I want you to do it today. You kind of started the conversation, but I'd love for you to take this back. You could do this with your staff. You can do this with your, your employers, whomever. But it's really important to understand how people identify and then what are areas that people don't identify with. Because as a leader, I may be digging into family and some folks are saying, you know what? I don't even deal with, I don't even like my family. Right? I'm, 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 being, I'm being real, right? Uh, so we really have got to be able to understand. Or somebody talked a little bit about that relationship status. Um, she said, I'm a mom. I've got kids. Um, and I'm looking for other uh, folks that I can go out to eat with and dinner that have kids. And then I told her, I'm the opposite. I'm a new empty nester. So I'm looking for people that can roll right now, right? So, <laughs> you know, it, it's really important. But as, <laughs> right? But so as, as a leader... We're all leaders, we're all educators. I want you to begin to think about what happens when I'm operating with an identity that folks can't relate to, right? And I'm trying to lead them. And when, and when I want to make sure that everybody has a sense of belonging, but I'm not even touching what's important to them, right? So that's, this is just an activity to kind of get you going. I want to tell you a little bit about me, but I, that introduction was totally enough. I'm just kind of have you can't really see a lot of these, but these are just some logos of businesses that I've worked with. I've been from the East Coast to the West Coast. I spend a lot of time in my gorgeous Midwest area here. Um, K-12 education, um, university level, um, statewide level, uh, and I do a lot of work with small businesses and medium-sized businesses. And it's all about transformational learning, right? So a lot of times people say, I've been an educator for 30 years, which is kind of amazing. Huh? I got to stop telling people I'm 35, though, right? That doesn't, <laughs> that math doesn't add up. I know. So what I want you to know, though, so I want you to know that I'm going to be talking to our educators, but I think that we're all educators, right? We're all here to learn about ourselves and to grow, right? We're all here that, because we're, we're leading, right? And we're, and we're and give, providing knowledge to folks. So I kind of consider us all educators. I'm going to be giving some examples of a case study that I've done with an actual school district, but I also invite you to say, guess what? This is also applicable to the business world as well. So as I go through these examples and what we want to do together, I want you to just continue to consider how does this match with me and where I am, right? So when we finish this today, I'm giving you some information, but it's going to be totally up to you to figure out what's useful, what, what, what did I hear, and how can I make myself an even better leader? So here's where we're going to be going today. I'm going to be talking about that sense of belonging. I'm going to be doing an overview of the equity leadership dispositions. I'm going to give you a small definition of equity in my mind so that we are on the same playing field and have the same knowledge of where I'm going with that. And then we're going to do and engage in some self-reflection and some strategy development. So my goal is that we're going to be working on something and we're going to have a product when we're done. And um, it'll be generated by us all. So how awesome is that? So let's just dig into the sense of belonging. I don't know if you know this guy, Abraham Maslow. We talk about Maslow needs. I wanted to tie in. We keep talking about this sense of belonging. Um, Maslow hierarchy of needs. He kind of created this, this hierarchy to say, hey, this is what motivates people, right? And so there's three sections on the side. Again, me trying to stay here because if I was in my classroom, you'd be boom, 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 right? So we got that, the basic needs, you got your psychological needs, and then you've got your self-fulfillment needs. So at the top is that self-fulfillment needs, meaning here's where I am when I'm at my peak, when I'm at my best, when I'm at my most creative. But what's tricky about this, the foundational components have to be in place before I could even get to that top part, right? So if you notice, our first two, the basic needs, I always give educators credit because we can't teach children when they come in and they don't have their base, basic needs met. So people wonder, we're providing the food, we're providing the daycare, we're providing, and not just education, but in our Boys and Girls Club, right? We can't get them to be at their best if they're missing some of these things, so some of the basic needs. Safety, right? But then look in the middle. This is why we're here today, right? That belonging. If people don't feel like they belong, they can't be at their highest and operate in their highest capacity. We will not pull out their most creative juices, 
okay, if the basics aren't being met. So when we begin to think about sense of belonging, in your booklet, you'll see some slides about how it is connected. When folks have, feel like they belong, it's amazing what they'll do and produce for you. They're happier. They, they're happier and they're more stable mentally, physically, all of that, right? So a sense of belonging is really important. So I want to just kind of use that to set the stage. Um, I also work with, I mentioned I work at Higher Ed, so I work for the University of Kansas. They kind of created this um, graphic, and I felt like, man, this graphic in my mind really helps you to really understand and explain equity in a way that's, I think, very easily understood, right? So what's the difference? So the first one is inequality, right? So take a peek at it. You see somebody, they've got resources to get to what they need, but then you have somebody here, what? They can't reach it, they can't get it, right? That's inequality. Some people have it, some people don't. Then you've got, excuse me, equality, where we have both are getting it, but we get the same thing. So maybe both of these folks have the resources. You see this person has a ladder that has easy steps. This person, did you notice that ladder there? Maybe a little bit more difficult. There's some people that may get it, but they have a little tougher time receiving what they need, but we're all getting the same thing. But what happens if I don't even need that book, right? Um, that's all I have as an option. That's equality, but then we've got equity. Equity is a little bit different. I don't need a ladder to get to what I'm looking for. I get what I need, you get what you need. That's equity. But then we have justice, right? So notice we've got a lot of variety of things. We've got even more people. We've got more resources to help folks to get what they need. So equity sets the stage for justice. And then justice, um, justice makes equity sustainable. So this is just kind of gives you a picture, and again, so that we kind of get the understanding of where we are with the definition. So again, giving people what they need when they need it, and then here, justice is we get them what they need when they need it, but we're willing to throw in whatever resources are available to ensure that they get what they need. So that's just the, the definition. I wanted to have that uh, common understanding as we move forward. When you think about leading for equity, so now you're all here, we want to ensure that folks feel like they belong. When we begin to think about leading for equity, it's going to be really important for us to look in the mirror, and then it's also going to be important to look out of the window, right? So my question is, which one, and, and on the count of three, I want you to point to the one that's the easiest that we probably do the most. Looking in the mirror or looking out the window? On three, one, two, three, point. It's much more easier to look out the window, look at what everybody else is doing. But to be an equity leader is going to be really important to do this first. You've got to look in the mirror and try to understand how are you leading, and is your leading providing you the best to help sure that to make sure that everybody has this sense of belonging, right? So this is a graphic that I love to use as well, looking uh, insight into myself and then an insight into those that I work with or an insight to our customers. So you've got customers and then our educators, our customers are our students and their families, right? So I just do this graphic, and when you look at self, it says how, I'm, how I understand myself and who I relate to, and then how I see inequities in the world that inform who I am, right? That's one thing. But then you've got to also do it with your organization. So I'm looking at it from myself. I'm looking in the mirror to see where I am. I'm looking out of the window to figure out who I'm trying to help and what I'm trying to do. It's important for the organizations to do the same thing. When you look at your organization, are there inequities in our, own, in our own organization? The culture, the structures, the internal practices. I heard Ms. Carter talk about that day. Sometimes our practices and our policies are actual barriers to what we're trying to do. And then as the organization, it's important to look out of the window. Inequities for those that we serve. So again, just kind of giving you a visual of what it is that we need to do. And if we choose to do it, there are some equity leadership dispositions. So you should see that in your book. I would love for you to write in your book because I don't think I had it on the slide be before I sent it. This is adapted from the New York Leadership Academy and we use it with this project that I'm doing in Wisconsin where we're working with the five largest urban school districts, uh, the Wisconsin Urban Leadership Institute. We're talking about the five equity leadership dispositions. I adapted it just a bit for today's workshop though. So we're going to be going through five equity leadership dispositions and as we go through the five equity leadership dispositions, I'm going to give you five. I want you to personally identify and say, hey, this is an area of strength for me. When I, when I hear this disposition, I look at it and I go, you know, I'm actually pretty good at doing this. And then I want you to hear them and kind of go, man, I really need to, like, lean in on this one because that's not something that I'm doing. And I want you to do the same thing for your organization. What are we good at? What's probably something within these dispositions that I need to figure out how we can do better? So I'm going to go through the five leadership dispositions and I'm going to talk about a case study. There's some work that I did with Menominee Falls school, um, High School and I want to talk, and it's actually the school district, but I'm going to talk about that as I explain these dispositions, okay? 
So the first one, and I write it down because I want you to remember, like, which one are you going to be doing some work with this too, right? So I want you to think about the first one. If I am um, at a leadership if, and I'm, like, leading with equity, the first disposition is personally being able to reflect. There's so often that we have conversations, we do things, and then afterwards, when we think back, that's reflecting. That's where the learning happens, right? So when you think about reflecting, you got to reflect on your assumptions, your beliefs, your behaviors. I always mention here, when I reflect, I want to not just reflect on what I think, but I also want to pull in information from other folks. I want to pull in data from other folks, because that's what I want to reflect on. If, in fact, I've heard on several occasions that, I, uh, that I'm bossy at home, I'm bossy at work, I'm bossy, 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 I need to take a step back and kind of go like, is that true? Probably not, but no, no. <laughs> But I got to go and I got to really think about that because I may believe it or if I'm hearing it in multiple settings, then I really need to think about it. If that's what I want to come, uh, you know, if that's what I want to be labeled as, then I can kind of keep going with that. But if that's not something that I want to be connected to me, I get an opportunity to think about like, oh, yeah, you know what? That may be true. Let me show you what uh, Menominee Falls did. They had a survey and... Um, they do this climate survey with their schools, and, this, and one of their pillars is about the sense of belonging. So they did a whole survey with their students, and they got a low rating with their students about feeling like a sense of belonging. So what they decided to do is they decided to bring me in as a consultant. We generated together five questions that we asked this group of students. We just started asking, what are the most positive things? What are the most negative things about uh, attending your school? Do you feel like you belong? We got a rating from this group of students, a, a diverse group of students. We, we said, um, and it wasn't all ones, um, <laughs> but we, we had five questions. But then we said, um, describe an, op an obstacle, uh, obstacle that you face that maybe some of your other classmates don't experience. Um, what could your school do to support you better? They wanted to reflect on all the questions, and they didn't just listen and think what they thought, but they got feedback from the other students. So these are questions that they did from the questions that, and I like facilitated this whole thing. I got their answers back, and we did the fishbone activity. If you've never done that, where you say, "Hey, this is a sense of belonging," right? We're trying to increase that. What would help? So I had the students to generate what would help with this sense of belonging. They came up with a lot of different things. They they wanted some protocol around standards for um, address racial undertones. They, this, 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 these are students from ninth grade to 12th grade. It's amazing. what We've been talking a lot about youth. We underutilize the youth voice. I promise we do. But they came up with these things. And so once they generated, this was all anonymous. They talked about diverse staff. So I highlighted some of the things that they were talking about. And then I got a chance to work with this group. And I'll tell you what, what we did with some of this information. But they collected data. They reflected. And this is some of the things that kind of came out of that. The second disposition. You got to model the beliefs, right? We can't talk about it and then not do it. That's like me saying to my son, I'm drinking and I'm driving and I'm doing it and they see me, but I said, but don't you do that. It's not as, it's not as impactful if I'm doing what I don't want them to do, right? I need, I need to talk about it, but I also need to model it. So personal beliefs, your systems, and it's grounded in equity and inclusion. So you can't say that DEI is important to me and then you're not living it. You got to model it, right? So let me show you what Menominee Falls decided to do. So this is number two. The first one was, this is where you would answer. The first one was? personal reflection. The second one is modeling beliefs. So let me show you what Menominee Falls did. They said, hey, this is really important. They put together a student group that I got a, the opportunity to work with on a regular basis. They named themselves and they called themselves The Voice, not like the show, which I love the show, was on last night. But they call themselves The Voice, Voices of Individuals Changing Education. Is that amazing? Isn't that name just amazing? So this is the group that I got the pleasure, and I've done it for three years in a row. And this is the group, this is this last year's um, group here that I was working with. So the, the, they, you talk about modeling, the, the principal said, this is really important. So we want to model that this is important. They had me to come in quarterly during the school day. So it wasn't something they had to come in after school to do because it was important. They made it embedded a part of their day. They provided lunch for the students. They were so excited because it wasn't a school lunch. Um, <laughs> we had a diverse group of students, so it could have been easy to just get, you know, maybe all African-American students, all students are brown, uh, black and brown students because those are typically are some of the ones that are feeling um, like they don't belong. But guess what? We had a diverse. And then we found out that it wasn't just those students that felt like they didn't belong. There were others. So we had a diverse group of students, and then the students and 
consultant only. And what did that mean? That meant no adults from the building were there. It was just myself and the students. And you, it, I'm sure you know why we do that. They were telling me more than I wanted to know sometimes, right? <laughs> so that we had an opportunity. We set the stage for them to be open and honest to tell us exactly what they were feeling. Because what was nice is that this school district found it important to say, this is important, and we're going to allow you to help come up with the solutions. Isn't that something, right? So that's how Menominee Falls decided to model it. Here's the third, personally act. Again, act with cultural competence, responsiveness. And you've got to act in your interactions, your decisions, and then your practices. You've got to personally act. So let me show you. So that's the third one, personally act, right? You got, you're writing them down? I want you to begin to think about which one's going to be important for you, which ones do you have strengths in, which ones are you saying, yeah, I probably need to like, work on that myself personally, right? So, I just want to check time. Oh, you're going. Okay, so personally, act. let me show you what Menominee Falls did. So, I told you about this voice group. Well, the superintendent at that time was Mr. Corey Gala. He actually is still the superintendent at Menominee Falls. He said, you know what? You're at the high school, you're doing this work, but I want to personally come and take time out of my day and I want to hear what they're saying. So we're going to have a brown bag lunch. So you can see the picture right here. Um, that's him sitting there. He decided to come and he said, hey, I want to hear, tell me, if you were, and the, literally this was the question, if you were in superintendent for today, what would be your next move? What's important? What would you want to do? He took the time, and we were there almost two hours. The kids got engaged in this. They really took this job serious, right? So they had a dialogue with him. Um, they had questions for him. They were actually not only, because what I when I went and I facilitated this, I'm like, we're not just going to talk about the problems, but I want you to talk about the solutions as well, because we can complain all day. But I want you to come to the table with some solutions as, as well. So the students did just that. So they came to the table, and they had three requests. They said, we want to have a, a better communication with power school. Power school is where they all get communication when the school district wants to know or like communicate something. One of their complaints was, we get home and our parents know about incidents that have happened during the day and we don't even know about it. So the superintendent said, guess what, I got it. Every, when we have incidents, before you get home, we're going to send you back to your homeroom, and we're going to also give you a communication in power school so you don't have to find out about an incident that's happening in your building because you belong here. You're part of this. You should know before your parents know because you're here every day. They put that into play. Then the other thing, they, they said, hey, we want neutral gender bathrooms. So we talk about brown and black students, but also there were some students that say, hey, I'm having some gender identity. What can you do for us? He put that into play right away. And then the, uh, the other one seems kind of, you know, minute, but this is what the kids talked about. They said, hey, sometimes we want to sit in front of the building and we don't want to just go home right away. Some of them are driving. Some of them want, they don't get a chance to talk during the day. They're listening to their teachers all day, all day. They want to talk. They said, what about putting some benches right in the front of the school just so we can have a, a time to socialize and to talk? Minor, but the superintendent not only heard it, but he came and he personally acted and put all those things into play. He did some other stuff, but these are three that just stand out in my mind, and they, he executed right away. So the kids were able to see, like, I was a part of the, the, the solution, and then I saw my superintendent take my information and put something into play immediately, right? That's what he did. Now, here's the next one, conscious inclusion. So here we're talking about intentional, intentional actions and decisions that solely focus on a sense of belonging for all stakeholders represented. So we go back to that will that we talked about today, right? So if in fact that I want to be conscious about in including everybody, I've got to be intentional about some things. One thing that I'm going to say right here, I want you to think about your decision making team right now. I want you to visualize your leadership team. Everybody got that vision of who that is? Do they all look like you? Are they, all, are they all different? Are they representing that wheel? Are they representing the wheel in ways so you have different voices at the table when you're making some decisions? Yeah, I want you to think about that. It's really important because if, in fact, we really want to include everybody, we want everyone to have this sense of belonging, we have to ensure that we're really conscious about including and making sure that everybody's at the table and everybody's represented. And, you know, I don't want to hear sometimes people say, oh, well, we have, and I hear this a lot with education, we're sh we're, we have a shortage of um, African-American or teachers of color. Okay, so guess what? What else are you doing then? Are you getting the voice of some of the parents? Are you getting the voice of some of the community members? That's no excuse. You have to figure out how do I get different voices and different faces at the table. I can give one quick story. I sat on a board at a school, a private school, I won't say which one, but they were having this new teacher, this new student orientation, and they were having, uh, go figure, a pool party at a country club. And they were wondering, why didn't the African American students come? So when I got to the table, I'm like, oh yeah, we're not swimming like that. 
It's just, it's just facts. But they didn't have somebody at the table to give them just that bit of information. So if the goal was to get people to come and you want to really get the students to be included, then we got to figure out maybe a different activity. Matter of fact, have you asked the students themselves what would make them want to come? Your current students. So if there's a way and things that you can do if you really want to include someone, there's a way to do it. So with Menominee Falls, they put voice into action. I was able to facilitate and work with our students. They held uh, listening sessions with our board, with the excuse me, not our board, the Menominee Falls, so you, you, you get a job and you like really own the, the work that you're doing. They had an opportunity to talk to their board. They had, um, they, they used these students to talk to the new teachers when they came in. They used the students to talk to uh, the parent group. It's like, what are you doing and how are you including the voices that are not being heard? This is just a few examples of what they did. Um, I'll also talk about this a little bit later. The other thing they did, they started using that voice group to do something with the middle school, but I'll tell you about that in just a second. Fifth, disposition, improve systems. So we know that sometimes our systems, our policies, our procedures are the actual barriers themselves. What are you doing to improve the system? So you need to create structures and systems that promote equity and inclusion. You've got to improve the system. Sometimes that's the tough work, isn't it? And as you notice, it goes internal. You do that internal reflection. That's for you. That's something that you have control over. Sometimes we get to this one, we kind of go like, I have no control over that. But the question is, who does? And how do you get to here? And how do you collect data to ensure that the person that can make the decision can make the decision based upon data? Like, if something's not working, what are we going to do about it? Do we just keep going with the system and say, oh, well, that's just the way it's been running? That sounds kind of like ludicrous that we would do that, but we do it all the time. We know it's not working, but we continue to let the system play out the way it has played out. Let me tell you what Menominee Falls did. Menominee Falls, one of the systems that they created, which is kind of cool, um, voice, I told you that I just did, I did four years with them, to this year is my first year that I'm not going back, because you know what we did? We, we changed the system. Why should they have uh, outside consulting coming in, getting the information from their students, right? So this is one of those situations where I kind of go, yeah, I worked myself out of a job and I'm proud of it, right? So the question was, or what they did is, they decided to bring the student group to Menominee Falls, they opened it up for all the students, so my voice group is like the leadership group. They have a group for all of the students. And then this picture that you see, I did the same thing in Greendale. So what I did, you talk about systems changing, you talk about hearing information. I brought two groups together. I brought my student voice, they were set at Greendale, student equity team, and I brought uh, the voice together. And we had a dialogue, and we, we did a lot of dialogue and discussion. And we not only changed the system, but we put some things into place. So this was two groups that I brought to collaborate. Another, and so this is kind of just a picture. So when we get together, it's not just to sit and get the same way I'm going to get you guys going in just a minute. We really start digging in and trying to talk about what can we do differently. So again, if you bring the folks together that look different than the, the main, then you, you have to figure out a way to put things into action. So we got to going, we, you saw us working here. But then here's another thing that we did. We create um, a Voice Junior. That just happened last year. No, two years ago, actually. Voice Junior. So the voice was at the high school. We did Voice Junior. So they said middle school is not too young to begin to understand what they're thinking. And we brought them together. But let me tell you what's kind of awesome. You see this young lady right here kneeling on her knee and this person right here talking? That's one of my high school students. That's the voice. But she came and helped facilitate the voice junior. So what does that do? It's a couple different things, right? One, it creates that interest in education. So we know that there's a shortage, right? So guess what? I'm working with them. I'm giving them lesson plans and I'm saying, you got to do this and this is how you deliver and I want you to give eye contact. So we're developing interest in education just by changing the way it was working before. We're trying to change the system. We also said, hey, now if we're doing this, we've, we get a connection with our middle schoolers and our high schoolers. There may Some middle schoolers may have high school um, brothers and sisters at home, but some may not. But then when they get ready to go to the high school, then guess what? They're prepared to engage in activities like this. And so this wasn't me just talking. I'm doing um, activities to get them ready for college work. I'm, I'm having them to present. But we didn't just keep things the way the system was. We changed the system. That's what we did in Menominee Falls. There are five leadership equity dispositions. I want you to personally begin to think now. As you hear the five, you personally reflect, you model, you personally act, Conscious inclusion. How do I intentionally include everybody, especially thinking about that will? How do I get everybody involved? And then, how do I go about improving the system? I don't want to keep it the same, right? How do I go about doing that? So here's what's going to happen. Now, 
as a group, we are going to generate, because sometimes people will say, oh, I'm really good at that one. That's my area of strength. I'm, I, re I reflect all the time. Then they may say, I reflect, but then I don't act, though, right? That could happen, right? So what we're going to do is we're going together to generate this. We are going to be breaking out in a group. You're going to be working on one leadership disposition. And again, you're going to be able to get all of the information that we generate as a group. But you're going to, and so there's, uh, I think there's 11 tables. Each of you will be assigned one of the equity leadership dispositions. You're going to have a recorder. That's the person that's going to write on this piece of paper. You'll notice you see paper all along the wall. So I, this is where I want to get you up. You know, that's the, it's the teacher in me. You've been sitting long enough. So you're going to have a recorder. You're going to have a reporter. Not everybody will report out, but I just want to be able to report out one thing that you kind of generated as a group. You're going to have a timekeeper. That's the person to say, hey, we've been sticking on this one piece for too long. We got to move on. And then a facilitator. What does my facilitator do? At the table or at your, your groups, there's always somebody that dominates the group. This just happens. I mean, it's okay. But what I want the facilitator to do is to ensure that you hear everyone's voice, to ensure that we're following through with the tasks that I'm going to give you, right? So here's the task. I don't know why it keeps doing this one, 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 but anyway, don't, don't judge me on that. So um, what you're going to do at your table, once I assign you your disposition, you're going to describe the disposition in your own words. So I say personally reflect. There may be some other words that you want to claim it, because I want you to learn this so when we leave it, you kind of have it in your head. So you're going to give it your own, you're going to give it a name in your own words, or if you don't want to do that, you can just kind of create a symbol that it represents, that disposition. So that's the first task on this chart paper. On the second thing on the chart paper, you're going to say, what would you you see and or hear if this disposition is actively demonstrated? What would you see or hear? If I'm personally reflecting, what would I see? What would I hear? You're just going to generate that. That'd be the second assignment on this chart paper. The third thing that you're going to generate is a list of strategies or best practices uh, to strengthen this disposition. So this is where it comes in to say, like, if we're going to do this work and then we get a chance to share it out later, maybe this is an area that I'm struggling with as maybe the system. That's always a tough one, right? But the folks that are going to be generating, you're going to be generating a list of strategies and a list of uh, practices that you would maybe use or consider if you're trying to strengthen the disposition. Because it may be one that you're saying, yeah, I want to read what people are saying because that's one that I personally really need to work on, right? And then finally, be prepared to share a highlight. But then the most important, you see what's bolded under here, I want you to personally begin to think about which of these do you want to be able to say, when I leave here today, I want to make sure this is something that I focus on. It's important that I focus on this disposition for myself personally. Does that make sense? Any questions? So let's try it again. Workforce? Great. So if you would take your paper off of the wall and have a seat at your table, and I want all my ones, my one reporters to come up with their piece of paper. All of the reporters, and if you were assigned number one, personally reflect. I know, we're going to come up here, why, why? Or you can do it at your table, whatever. I'm not going to be too much of a stick. Now, come up to the front. All your good work. Come on. Encourage them to come up to the front. Give your colleagues some encouragement. Woo! Okay, so here, here we go. Okay, when you're ready, we'll be ready. So here's how we're going to present out our information. We have, and I want to make sure I do time, I told Ann I would be really good with time. So we're not going to like dig into all of it, but what I want our reporters to do is right now we have all of the personal reflects up here. I want you to just give me one component off of your chart that you'd like to share that somebody else did not um, share as a part of their, um, their chart. Does that make sense? But know that you will get a copy of all this. All the stuff is going to be typed up. You're going to get it all. Um, and remember, I want you to listen. If this is an area of strength for you or one that you want to work on, this, this, you want to listen to it, okay? So uh, group one, we're going to start on this end. Just give one something and then go down to all four, okay? Go for it. And you have to step here, I think. So I have 1.2. Are you 1.1? Oh, you're two. You're, no, we're all the ones. We're all the ones. Oh, all right. No, that's okay. That's all right. So we want all the ones here. And then what we're going to do, you're going to come right here. You're going to talk. You're going to say it so that Scott can hear you. And then you're going to have a seat. And then you're going to come and say. And then you're going to come. So that's the way we're going to work it. Everybody got it? Is this for just any part of the question? Just any part. You're going to talk. So they are talking about personally reflecting. And they can answer any one of the, the ones. And somebody, I'm not even going to say the joke. I'll tell about it later. Go ahead. Okay, you go. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, good. I've been told I have a very quiet voice. Um, our, we, we talked about, yes, number one, personally reflect, and what we uh, brought to this was, as a definition, was to really dig deep, be honest with yourself, be vulnerable, and really think about what, even if it's, you're afraid to admit it, what you really 
um, what are your assumptions about other people and stereotypes? And All right. So the two symbols that oops, the two symbols that we had chosen were the uh, clock and then also the eye. The eye is meant to represent. Um, well, the clock is meant to uh, represent allowing time for yourself, both in your personal life and at work, allowing that time to uh, reflect and um, also view other, you know, different perspective perspectives and be open and aware um, of yourself and other um, things that are coming up. And then the I is also just to take a look at um, not just what um, you're reflecting on, but also other things that um, you may be hearing from people from in your group or in your personal life, your family, your friends, um, anybody in the workforce. Um, just their suggestions and taking their criticisms as well um, and kind of uh, taking any solutions um, from them as well too. So just being open to other um, others and others' ideas. I guess in the world of education, I'll give you what every student says, they took all mine. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> um, one of the best strategies we thought of is just doing some journaling you know, writing down your thoughts, taking time for yourself, um, and they hit on it a little bit, but accepting that feedback as well. So that's what we have. Okay, for uh, number two, it's really just walking the walk. You're you're doing it. You're modeling it. You are being uh, being that person that people can see in your actions and your voice. Um, we we similar walking the walk, but we also talked about meeting people where they live. And then uh, one of the big things I think we took away was being able to experience discomfort. So um, if you're going to model the beliefs, you have to be able to push it another step. So you're Uncomfortable. What we came away with um, was that at the end of the day, the breaking down silos was important because if you want to allow other people in, you got to make room for them to get in. And it, it doesn't only matter in this area, there's so many areas where we all work and live in certain silos, and it's very hard to interact or open up until you get rid of those. So part of number three, what we had kind of discussed is making sure that not only are you including key people that can make decisions and affect what is done and make those changes, but also make sure that you're rotating, including everyone to get all those different perspectives, make sure that everyone's voice is being heard. And then overall, out of that example of the superintendent sitting down, eating the same brown bag lunch as everyone else, meeting them at the same level, making sure that you're coming to that conversation as an equal to make sure that the discussion is flowing, there's no intimidation, and everyone's kind of free to speak their mind and make sure that those changes can be made. Okay, so I'll take that. Today's lesson is don't walk away from your group because they'll nominate you to speak. <laughs> can you come to the mic? You might go to the mic. I usually am not told I speak quietly. So. No, it's for the, the camera. Okay. All right, so we looked at the fact of acting. We had that green light, it means go. Make sure that um, you're doing something with the feedback that you're getting. Um, and you're gonna be able to see some of the actual change in doing that, whether it's positive or negative. Hopefully it's gonna be that your team members are definitely excited about what's going on. Um, and you'll be able to see it by potentially increased productivity, um, less absenteeism, and then, uh, just continuing to collaborate. And one, our group also talked about 
a challenge they had in their workforce around COVID where they put in um, a new ice machine and a team member came and thanked them for doing that, but it didn't work. And nobody knew the ice machine didn't work. So making sure you keep those communications open, continue collaborating to be able to make sure you're getting what you thought. Um, so, uh, we believe that when there is equal ownership around the table, great ideas occur, and you will hear a symphony and see a garden grow. Kristen, Kristen, that was deep. I don't know how I'm going to follow it. I guess. Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, of course, we had conscious inclusion as well, and we talked about making sure that people feel like they can share their ideas and can com contribute their ideas um, appropriately. They have a safe space to do so, and recognizing when people do bring problems or challenges um, about, uh, that's going on within the organization, um, and to incentivize people to bring forward ideas in whatever way possible. I feel intimidated standing up here with you guys. You guys <laughs> probably had all the answers on it. Go in front of the mic. Okay. Um, so our, we actually described our improvement systems as an ongoing circle, actually eventually expanding and um, growing, um, showing that we're constantly improving, adjusting, and reconnecting. Um, we wanted to empower our team, uh, experience growth change, um, we need to foster inclusion and um, identification of defined constraints to, to make the improvements. And then actually the, the groundwork happens with the engagement um, and communication starting from basically the bottom up, um, needing to create safe zones for people to, to be willing to communicate and um, be free of um, any type of negativity associated with that. Um, we would want active participation, and we are actually looking to promote a cultural change. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, and our symbol was very similar, um, but we looked at it as from improving systems. We had there in our organizations or schools or um, any stakeholder environment, we have multiple systems, multiple structures. So we thought it was important that they're integrated so we can in, uh, look at all systems more holistically, which is what that symbol represents. Um, in terms of how we will, what was it, model it, uh, we will, I, we will see it, we will hear it. The hand means we are engaging and everyone understands it. Now, when it comes to best practices, we talked about uh, creating opportunities for conversation and connecting. And when you're creating the opportunities to connect people, you're you want to raise the awareness of your individual needs. And once we raise those, the awareness of those needs, then you have to change. And when you change, um, then the organization, business, or school needs to make sure that that's um, transparent, sustainable, measured and then there's a big feedback loop that goes back up to uh, again listening to that voice an opportunity for conversation and connection all right i told you it wasn't gonna be a sit and get you guys got did some work and you get an opportunity to be a part of what we develop together. So how awesome is that, right? So this is what you were able to do. I want to end with diversity is having a seat at the table. Inclusion is having a voice. And belonging is having that voice to be heard, OK? Uh, I thank you so much for listening to me today and being a part of this. But I need you to know that daring leaders work to make sure people can be themselves and feel a sense of belonging. Are you a daring leader? You need to ensure that everybody feels like they have this sense of belonging. Finally, if you enjoyed yourself, 
Here's my contact information. My name is Alicia Mutri, and I am a part of 4AM Consulting. I'm the president and CEO of that. People think 4AM is about time. Well, since I'm getting older, I am working, waking up a lot about 4AM. But it really is just something that I've decided to do for myself for Alicia Mutri, a business that I love, that I enjoy doing, about trying to take you from where you are to the next level, being that outside eye to help you to get where you're trying to go. If you didn't like what you heard, my name is Alicia Keys, all right? <laughs> all right, workforce. Thank you all.